Welcome to Real Christianity. Today we are talking about... Is your pastor biblically qualified? I think an important conversation for the church today is the pastor that you're, uh, of the church that you're at, biblically qualified. We've actually done a couple episodes on uh, this topic or around this topic. We did an episode titled The Seven Criteria of a Biblical Church. You're welcome to listen to that. We kind of briefly touch on the issue that we're going to talk about today. And we also did one called uh, Is It Okay for a Pastor to be Rich or Wealthy? And uh, again, just talking about the posture and character of a pastor. Um, if you want to listen to those episodes, you can always go to relearnchurch.org forward slash listen. You can find all of our shows there, as well as the uh, the show notes for those episodes, including this one, and um, uh, just available for you. The, the YouTube video, the audio download, it's all available for you there. Uh, one uh, other thing I want to mention before, actually I'm going to say two other things I want to mention before we dive in to today's episode is this. Uh, we are just finishing up. Finally, as I've been talking about, the Ultimate Marriage Program, I've been kind of taking you guys along every episode. We're done. We're, we're almost done with all the edits. We're just at this point mastering the files, getting thing, everything beautiful, making sure the flow and the experience is great. We might even launch Ultimate Marriage by the time this episode airs. Ooh, so it's we're, we're getting very close. If you're interested in becoming a part of our six-week marriage mentor program with your small group or individuals, go to ultimatemarriage.com. And if we hadn't launched it yet, you can be signed up to be notified. And if you just go to ultimatemarriage.com forward slash notify, you can do that. Otherwise, um, you can sign up if it's open by the time you get there. So we'll find out. Uh, we're just making sure that we get everything perfect before we launch. Um, so diving into the conversation, I think that many, if not most Christians, uh, have been kind of placed themselves under a shepherd or a pastor without really evaluating if they meet the Bible's criteria for ministry or for pastoring. I think it's a pretty common thing. And I think it's likely because we confuse spiritual giftedness with spiritual qualification. Um, I want to say that again because I want you to catch that. I think we, we, we really look at spiritual giftedness instead of spiritual qualification. And uh, this is where I think a lot of people kind of get tripped up or deceived in this. And our hope for this episode is really that you would have the tools, the understanding, and the resources to assess if you're being shepherded by someone who really meets the criteria, uh, the Bible's criteria for what a, a shepherd really is. Yeah, um, speaking on that, just recently, um, a friend of ours uh, told us a story about one of their friends who is um, a current, who was currently an unemployed worship pastor mm -hmm. um, and they were looking for a job at a church and he recently had an interview with the pastor and was um, offered the job mm -hmm. but uh, he wasn't sure if he should take the job and so he called our friend and said so I got the worship leader position but I want your thoughts on a few things and he mentioned that the pastor is single childless and a woman and he was asking our friend if he thought it was okay for him to accept this position. Yeah, and so uh, we got two things to deal with here. One, the first mm -hmm. is the fact that a, a worship leader, someone that's a leader in the church. Yeah, and if you listen to our podcast on worship music, yes. was that last week or something, like maybe a couple weeks ago? We yeah. touch on this a lot. If you're a worship leader, if you're, you're you are actually shepherding you're in a position of shepherding yeah you're in a position of leadership mm -hmm. um now the fact that a worship leader is asking this question is really bad enough mm -hmm. so that that's its own issue but there's also really like a, a sad sincerity about this question um i i really think that this this poor guy he he loves jesus um and ha has really no idea what the bible says uh, about what qualifies or disqualifies a person from being a pastor and unfortunately, I think that this is kind of an, a universal ignorance in the church. I think this is a pretty common uh, lack of knowledge. And I say this because this is really a part of our story, too. Yeah. Um, several years ago, you know, we, we didn't know what to look for. And, and I'm going to ask Veronica, you know, when you first became a Christian um, and you first started going to church, what was it that you were looking for in a pastor? Like, did, did you even know what to look for in a pastor? What was your experience there? No, I think I when I gave my life to the Lord and I became a believer um, and wanted to follow Christ and everything that I did, said, and thought. Um, I just kind of took their word for it. Mm -hmm. If you're on the pulpit, then I would just assume. Like, I never even thought, 
like, oh, there's qualifications. I just assumed that they were. And then as I uh, developed in maturity and reading the word more and being around other um, stronger believers, I would hear, you know, like s- they went to so and so seminary and things like that. So mm-hmm. then I was like, oh, okay, they they must have to go to seminary. It's like any other job, right? You go and you yeah. get a degree. Yeah, and then they were also incredibly gifted. I know when I was saved, I was I personally was saved due to a very um, gifted speaker, mm-hmm. and. Um, I felt super convicted of my sin and that's when I gave my life to the Lord. Um, but yeah, it was just, maybe, maybe I thought like, oh, maybe they just, they have to be gifted. They have to be talented in that area to be able to teach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're saying that really there's, I think common things that what we think is qualifications are is, oh, they, they have their MDiv from this seminary, right? They're they're masters in divinity. They're seminary graduate. Yeah. I didn't even know what those like words, words meant. They went to Bible college, right? Or, or I remember uh, someone was like, oh, he went to uh, Dallas Theological Seminary and I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Just thought it was like any other college. Yeah. Did I know it was (laughs) like one of the best ones? Yeah. And so you have this, this idea of seminaries and then you have, um, the idea of, oh, they're, they're really gifted just because they can teach means that they should teach. Um, and then I think the most common thing is, well, you just believe because the, you're new to the church and you don't know much about the Bible and you assume that the people that are running the church know a lot about the Bible. Mm-hmm. Therefore, this the pe- is a trustworthy person or a qualified person in this position to be guiding us and leading us. Yeah, which now you're having all types of pastors of any type of background today. Pastors that yes. are uh, homosexual pastors. You're having issues. You're having things with uh, women pastors. You're having things with pastors who are not married. We have pastors that are single or uh, no, no children. Pastors with, with no training. Mm-hmm. Pastors um, that are still walking in sin. There, there are so many different issues that are going on today in terms of pastoring. Um, that it's, uh, yeah, it's an it's issue. It's really sad. It is an, it is an issue. Yeah. Um, so, uh, an old theologian once said a really important quote. I want to share it today. It says the man first builds the institution, but then the institution begins to, f- to build the man. And again, I think that's what happened is that kind of the church, we, we built this idea of the church and the institution and the seminary and all the things. And then all of a sudden now we're learning a lot from the institution instead of from the Bible. And so I think Christians are so biblically illiterate that they actually go to church and they just believe everything that their church does is somewhere in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, really all about deception. And th- the thing about deception and being misled is that when you're being deceived and you're being misled, you don't know that you're being deceived or being misled. And the only way that you can actually determine if uh, you're living in a lie or, or living in a false experience is by going back to the scriptures, going back to the Bible mm-hmm. and measuring uh, y- your experience against what God says your experience should be. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, again, there shouldn't be any doubt in the church when we're measuring, you know, a pastor against scripture because uh, the Bible is super clear and it lays it out exactly what the qualifications are of a biblically qualified pastor are. They do that, uh, the Bible does that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, and and uh, and Titus 1. It's also, um, s- you know, throughout the scriptures, there's stuff in Acts, there's stuff in, in Peter, uh, there, there's a variety of things even in the Gospels and understanding what a shepherd is to do. Uh, and we're going to look at those qualifications in a minute. But there is definitely no reason to not know because they are so clear in the scriptures as you guys will see shortly. Yeah, something that I found really interesting is that the actual word pastor is only mentioned one time in the entire Bible. I know. It's such a weird and thing, yeah, right? yeah, and it's basically a word that describes uh, the position, and the position, which Dale will break down, is shepherd. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the word pastor being mentioned so few times in Scripture, it's amazing how many titles we have built upon just that name. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there we've got what the worship pastor, as we've mentioned, the youth pastor, the children's pastor, the community pastor, the singles pastor, uh, the marriage pastor, uh, the parking lot pastor, you know, <laughs> kind of just slap what, uh, any title with <laughs> the word pastor following and it's now a thing. Yep. Um, and it's, yeah, it's almost become like a hired job instead of 
being a divinely appointed call. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction that you're making here um, about it because we've totally done that. We've just adopted all these titles and just kind of slapped them on. Oh, yeah, here, you take up this position. If you if you meet the, the qualifications of being a, an employed person, you can come and be this pastor. Um, you know, the role that we have called pastor, the Bible actually calls elder or overseer. That's that's what we see in scripture. Uh, that we see that word way more, obviously, than the word pastor. The word pastor mm-hmm. only comes up once. Elder and bishop or overseer, shepherd, these words are, are more frequently used. Uh, basically, the, the word, because the word pastor, which again just means shepherd, uh, is simply a description of what the elder does. You cannot be a pastor without being an elder. And I'm going to say that one more time because I want you to catch this, okay? Because the word pastor is simply a description of what the elder does, you cannot be a pastor without being an elder. And you can't be an elder without being a pastor. Okay, uh, you know, the, the idea of a pastor who is not an elder is not a biblical idea. It's kind of like an impossible thing to happen, okay? Um, you, you can have a pastoral gifting that you're trying to mature into a pastoral office eventually while not being an elder. Meaning that, like, say you're a young man and you go, man, this guy's got a pastor's heart. He's, a, he's, he's trying to become meet the qualifications of becoming a pastor at some point. Mm-hmm. He could be nurturing and growing that pastoral gifting. He's still not a pastor. Mm-hmm. He's still not in the pastor's office. But if you're going to wear the title of pastor and you're actually going to shepherd a flock of God's people, then you better meet the qualifications for pastor, for shepherd, for overseer that are found in the Bible. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So Veronica is going to read um, First, First Timothy. Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. This is one of the spots in scripture that gives very clear um instructions, yeah, rules, description. descriptions of what a elder is. Um, okay. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of an overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. Mm-hmm. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And uh, one thing I want to talk about here is... Uh, if this is true for the leaders in the church, then it's definitely true for each and every one of us. Mm-hmm. And so it's really easy to kind of isolate these qualifications or these character traits into their own kind of category as if like only those people need to be that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but God doesn't have double standards. That's not that's not the case. Uh, he doesn't say to the elders, hey, you guys be super holy and righteous. Everybody else just has to be holy and righteous. Mm-hmm. No, w- these are the expectations of, uh, for God's people um, from the top down in terms of maturity. And, uh, you know, sure, for the church quality, like these are things that everybody should desire, and they are things that are required of the elders and, and also the deacons, which we're not talking about today. But I just want to point that out. I think it's an important conversation to have is that these aren't just for them. They're also for you. These are characteristics for you as well. So I'm going to I want to read you guys these qualifications briefly. We're going to just fly through them here. And as we're doing this, there's 17 of them. And I want you to evaluate your pastor against these biblical qualifications. And if he meets them, praise God, you're at a blessed uh, Mm -hmm. church. And and, and that's a great thing. Um, we, We had a pastor who met these qualifications for several years. We are now in a shepherd's role, meaning that uh, we look at these qualifications regularly to make sure that we are s- uh, staying within these qualifications. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, let's start with the first qualification. I'm going to go. Just really quick. Yeah. On that note, not just us. We look at them, but our the people in our fellowship as well. Look at them. We're not the ones making the call. <laughs> yeah, we don't. that we're qualified. Yeah, we don't self-qualify. We, mm-hmm. we Our congregation is the one who evaluates, just like we're asking you to do, mm-hmm. evaluate if we are in that office because they can see these things be true of our life. Yeah. Yeah. Just want to bring clarity to that. Yeah. So 
Uh, number one qualification is the pastor is a man. The overseer is a male office and uh, it's not it's not of a woman it's not a woman's office uh, I didn't write it so you don't get to get mad at me um, but that is what the scriptures teach so I'm just gonna leave it at that but it is a position for men uh, second point is uh, he says they're blameless mm -hmm. now I want to talk about that for a second blameless doesn't mean faultless it doesn't mean that they haven't fallen they that they don't have mis make mistakes that they that they don't um, have error, um, but th the difference is that they don't have a reputation of evil or a, c a pattern of evil or a pattern of habitual sin. Uh, th they're, they're, they're not known for those things. They're, they're above reproach. I was going to say, I think that they, they're even proactive in protecting themselves in those areas. Yes, it, they're, they're really trying to walk a holy and righteous life because they are the example for the flock as they follow Christ. Um, husband of one wife. The elder is a one-woman man, and I know you might be thinking in terms of polygamy. Uh, you know, this could have, this is definitely an issue of the time. Um, how many wives does Christ have? Well, he only has one, and it's the church. And so we are to model that. And I, does this disqualify the man who has been divorced? Um, some believe so. Um, I don't have an opinion on that. Because uh, the Bible doesn't specifically speak to that, but it does say that you're the, the husband of one wife. And I think that's a really important distinction. Uh, m moving on to uh, number four, temperate means that you're not an angry person. Uh, number five, sober minded. It means that you're a, you're, you're a man who's centered on biblical truth. Uh, you're firm, you're steady, you're not easily swayed. Um, you, 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 you really believe what you believe. And you're not being um, obsessed with some of these kind of fluke theological ideas or, you know, I, I've heard all the, the I always re references, the flat earth folks in the church. I'm like, dude, I don't care if the earth's flat. Jesus is here. He came. He died. Uh, he rose again. And he's sitting in the right hand of the Father. I don't care if the earth's flat or round or square. Um, I'm not going, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and so you kind of get set aside with all these like weird things. You're not sober minded when those kind of things happen. Just focus on the scriptures, the facts, the call. Um, good behavior. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's number six. Number seven is hospitable. I'm going to say that they prefer company. Like they're, they love people and they want to spend time with people. And uh, what's the definition of hospitality? Showing others their worth showing and others, their value. Uh, yeah, their Something worth like that, right? Yeah, that was good. <laughs> showing others their worth and value. You're, you're hospitable. You like showing people their value. Um, number eight is able to teach. They have the gift of teaching. I, I would say to an extent, because in Titus it talks about the elder's task, is to um, correct and exhort and rebuke those who contradict the word of God. So I'm, I'm talking, you got to not just be like, I have a teaching gifting. You got to be trained, studied, prepared, and capable of exhorting, correcting, and rebuking those who contradict the word of God. That, that extensiveness of, a, of teaching is what I think it's talking about. Um, number nine, not given to wine. And I, I, I would say, does this mean that you can't drink at all? Um, I think it means you're definitely not a drunkard. I think mm -hmm. that's what the passage is translated in some other versions too. But uh, I would say you're not drinking that often. It's not something that you do regularly. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a glass of wine on your anniversary with your wife? Uh, sure. But I, I, I don't think that that is what it's talking about. You're not given to wine. You're not desiring for it. Um, not violent. Uh, Self-explanatory. Number 11, not greedy for money. And so with the uh, Instagram account, Preachers and Sneakers, which we talk about in that other episode, where you have these pastors wearing $4,000 jackets and $2,000 pairs of shoes, this should absolutely raise some red flags mm -hmm. in your heart and, and go, whoa, that doesn't line up right. That doesn't look like Jesus. You know, follow me as I follow Jesus in my $2,000 pair of shoes. Like that just doesn't sound right. And so uh, they're, they're not serving the church for monetary gain or, or being immodest with their wealth. Mm -hmm. um, number 12, gentle. This doesn't mean they're soft. It, it means that they're, 
they're compassionate, they're patient, they're caring. Mm -hmm. Um, Number 13, not quarrelsome. Um, I I like a friend of mine just interpreted this, uh, I think, in a really helpful way. He said, they don't argue. They, They don't ever let discussions turn into arguments. They, they refuse to argue. They refuse they to. just don't do it. Because mm-hmm. an argument is striving, mm-hmm. like in the flesh. Like, I'm going to win this thing, and it's not about the Holy Spirit doing the work. And so they're not arguing. They're, they're not quarrelsome. Covetous uh, is number 14. He's content with where the Lord has him. You don't see someone that's constantly on the gain, you know. And, and I know we can, there's nothing wrong with achieving and growing and moving forward, but just this constant need to perform and, and, and looking at other people's things and wanting other people's lives. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Number 15, rules his own household well. Um, and so I would say this is a household isn't just your wife and children. I believe it's your property. I believe it's your finances. Is everything in order there so that you can be the example to your flock in all things, not just in family, but whatever the Lord has given you, if it's a small apartment, that thing is taken care of. It's clean. It's you. You care for the things that the Lord has entrusted to you. Um, I would say that also extends to like, are you wallowing in deep in debt? You know, have you been able to uh, be trusted with God's money? And so that's another element. I, it could be extend. I could have extended that a little beyond what the text says, but that's my take. Uh, number sixteen. Um, they have children. And their children are obedient and in submission to uh, this elder. Uh, because if you can't even run your own household and, and have your own children into submission to you, how can you run the house of God? That's what it says in the passage. And I, I think that um, this is interesting because it clarifies that these children need to be old enough. One, it's not child. And then it's children. Mm-hmm. And and they need to be old enough in which you can determine, wow, that, that's, that child is in submission to their father. And I, I'd say that happens somewhere between four and up. You can start to see really if a child is in submission and obviously really see it at 10, 12, 13, 14. Mm-hmm. Um, this doesn't mean perfect children. This means obedient children. Um, and so I want to, because, you know, pastors got a lot going on and it's really easy to be critical of the pastor. So obedient, loving, um, ordered children not perfect children. And number 17 is not a novice. Man, you you shouldn't be new to the faith and walking in a leadership position. You shouldn't be new to the Bible's theology and walking in a leadership position. Um, You need to be able to understand, again, the word well enough that you can defend it, um, that you can present it and understand the mechanics of the gospel quite well and explain it to other people that you could bring them along the journey. So those are the 17 requirements. And I want you to, again, think, does my pastor meet those qualifications? That's a, it's a really important and valid question. Yeah, so after going through those 17 qualifications, now let's just say you hear them and you say, well, you know, I think my pastor meets these qualifications. Great. Um, but another point that I did want to make uh, that really shifted uh in my journey was recognizing the difference between a biblical pastor who feeds and guides and protects, um, protects the church and the evangelist who simply teaches basic gospel messages each week in hopes to convert people to Christ. Yeah. So you got like point A is you have this person as the, the pastor, the who, shepherd, the yeah. shepherd. He's caring for his flock. And then point B is this evangelist. They're, they're, they're biblically important roles, both oh, of them. Oh, absolutely. But they're mm-hmm. different. Yeah. So just because your pastor might meet the qualifications of an elder, it still doesn't necessarily mean that they are truly pastoring. Um, many churches today are led by evangelists mm-hmm. um, who, are, who tend to be just more focused on the visitors than they are to the committed people in their flock. And that's kind of the, how the church that you were saved in, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a visitor-centric church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with that and intrinsically wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's a really important point because, you know, sure, every pastor needs to be concerned with the gospel. We need to be making sure that we present the gospel. I would say you should be able to present the gospel in every sermon that you preach. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, the gathering of the church and the evangelistic outreach of the church are two separate endeavors. Mm-hmm. And we need to realize that. And and sadly, I think the evangelist has kind of taken the spotlight. And that's why we have a pretty 
uh, young in their journey, immature church, were living on milk because uh, the lost, uh, the people that are new to the faith, they need milk. They're babies. Babies need milk to survive. Mm -hmm. The problem is that an adult surviving on milk will die. And that's why if you're there for 10 years, but you're still every Sunday as an evangelistic message over and over again, you're, you're not being fed and led by a shepherd. You're, you're, you're just watching evangelism occur again, and you're understanding the elementary parts of the gospel over and over and over again. So just because you have a qualified evangelist that meets at elders' qualifications, that's still not a pastor. And, and those are different ministries. Mm-hmm. Um, pastoral ministry even says that. Uh, there, there are some apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some pastors, and some evangelists. Mm-hmm. There are two different roles in Ephesians 4 that you, that you hear about that. So I want to just, that's an important distinction that you made there. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to close by asking the obvious question, which is, what do you do if you're at a church and your pastor doesn't meet these qualifications? Um, or that your church really is an outreach for evangelism every week, and it's not a gathering of the saints to the edifying of the, 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 the believers for the work of their ministry. Mm-hmm. What do you do then? And I'm going to say that you have two options. One, if you're at a church, you're close to the leadership, you, I would say have a conversation and, and compare the scripture against what you see that's not lining up in their life. I would do that uh, gently in love, Mm -hmm. uh, according to Matthew 18. Um, And then if that's not an option for you, I would say sit before the Lord and pray that the Lord places you in another local church and and consider going on a journey to look for another gathering. And again, we have a great podcast on that titled The Seven Criteria of a Biblical Church, Mm -hmm. which you can use to evaluate really what should I be looking for when I'm looking for a biblical church. So awesome. hopefully this was helpful for you guys. And we, we really care about people being inside of a church that is biblical. Mm-hmm. That's what we're here. That's our ministry at relearnchurch.org. Um, if you guys uh, would do one favor for me, um, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the episode. If you guys are a regular listener to the show, would you guys consider just leaving a quick review on iTunes? You don't even need to write anything. You could just tap the stars. Those reviews really do help the exposure of the show. If you do write something, I read them every day and would appreciate your feedback. Uh, But again, thanks guys for joining us today. We will see you next Wednesday.